Good morning and welcome to the 20th meeting of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for 2019. Um, I would remind everyone in the public gallery to turn off electrical devices so as not to interfere with the work of the committee. Item one is a decision on taking business in private, that is to take items four, five and six in private as the committee agreed. Yes. Thank you. And item two is a decision on taking business in private. Uh, it is a decision by the committee to consider its draft stage one report on the Scottish National Investment Bank Bill in private at future meetings. Are we agreed? Yes. Thank you. Now this morning we turn to our evidence on the Scottish National Investment Bank Bill again. And uh, we have with us Derek Mackay, Cabinet Secretary for Finance, um, Economy and Fair Work. So welcome to you. David Wilson, Programme Director for the Scottish National Investment Bank Directorate. Uh, Rachel Van Kempen, Head of Finance and Resourcing, uh, again from SNIB. And finally, Fraser Goff, Parliamentary Council Office. So welcome to all of you. Um, I'll invite the Cabinet Secretary to make uh, a brief opening statement at this point. Cabinet Secretary. Good morning. The publication of a draft bill is a significant milestone in the creation of the bank, laying the foundations for it to begin investing in businesses and communities across Scotland from 2020. The bank has the potential to transform Scotland's economy, as shown by the widespread support for the bank and the excitement it has generated. The bill gives a clear basis for establishing the bank, ensuring that it is commercially minded and publicly accountable. Work to establish the bank so far, including developing the bill, is the product of collaboration with stakeholders from across Scotland's economy and society. Consultation and discussions with stakeholders have been crucial to the progress made in meeting the ambitions for the bank set out in the implementation plan. And certain key decisions are still to be taken before the bank becomes operational, including the products it will offer, its structure and the scope of its missions. And of course, key to its success will be the way the bank acts and evolves over time when it is operational. And I therefore welcome the committee's role in furthering public debate around the bank. The committee has heard in the evidence it's received a constructive discussion on aspects of our proposals and will continue to engage widely, including with this committee, as we finalise our proposals to ensure that the bank can truly transform Scotland's economy. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. May I start by asking uh, about uh, the question of lending solely to private sector or not and commercial activities of the bank? And I think the, the bill team has recently clarified some aspects of this for the committee, as you'll be aware. Um, could you add any further clarification to the question of the bank's approach to private sector lending and commercial activities with reference to the bill? Since what we mean by commercial is essentially a not public sector, um, but that said, the clarification that I've provided is clear that it can invest in social enterprises, uh, third sector and cooperatives. It's largely the nature of funding coming through financial transactions, of course, that is uh, loans and equity. And it's for that reason it's got that commercial nature. But because of the uh, environmental uh, and other um, uh, societal and social burdens that we're applying to the, to the bank, clearly it's not just a commercial entity, although a PLC it's also a public body. So that commercial element is just by the financial instruments it can use and it doesn't invest in the public sector in the way that government would do through resource or capital grants. Is that helpful? Yes, I think, I think that's a very helpful clarification. Thank you. Um, another a few questions, perhaps. The, the question of the bank carrying over funds from year to year and dispensation from Her Majesty's Treasury, can you tell us where we're at with that? It is a matter that I've raised with Liz Trust, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, um, uh, including in writing. This is still under discussion. I mean, essentially, if we don't get that dispensation, I think it will constrain the, the bank and how it can invest and, and, and balance its affairs. And I think in trying to give the bank as much operational independence as possible, I, we would have more control than you might like over the bank if um, it didn't have that ability to carry over uh, resources. 
what do I mean in practice here? Well, we're bound by the financial framework agreement where there are parameters set, there's caps set on our resources, on a reserve, and on the uh, carryover. If the bank's resources are part of that, then it constrains the bank. Whereas if they have that dispensation, that, that freedom, um, then, then they have more financial independence of government within all the parameters that will set out, of course. Uh, now, I think um, I've discussed this with the Chief Secretary of Treasury in person. I've written to her. Um, I've also engaged with the um, Secretary of State on the margins of other events as well to express how important this is. It will still be manageable for us. I mean, the bank will still be able to operate without the dispensation, but it just makes it easier. Let me give me a practical example. If, let's say, there was a big receipt or, or return that came in near end of financial year uh, and the, the government was close to our own uh, parameters, that might be really unhelpful, and then you're just trying to manage it, manage the, the, the accountancy exercise at the end, just rather than be able to receive and continue to invest. So it's a kind of dispensation that the British Business Bank would have. So. I'm not asking for any extra resource that Treasury will be delighted to hear. I'm just asking for that flexibility to be able to manage resources for the bank in a way that doesn't overly constrain either the bank or the government through the fiscal framework agreement as it stands right now. Of course, by the time the bank is operational, we're getting nearer the end of this term, and therefore there'll be the opportunity to revisit in the discussions around the fiscal framework agreement in any event uh, but it would be better to have this dispensation from the start. So discussions are ongoing with the Treasury. I think it's, I think it's helpful. I think it's necessary. It would be manageable without, but far from desirable. So I hope that the Treasury uh, ultimately comes to the conclusion that it's worthy of giving us this dispensation. And perhaps a, a final question from me on the question of state aid rules and possible permission required from the European Commission. Can you update us where we're at on that? I think the committee will be well aware of the uncertainty around Brexit negotiations at the moment. So the UK government hasn't been, let's say, enthusiastic to notify. In any event, we want to build up the case so the notification, the pre-notification's right anyway. Um, ultimately, we would pass the, the work to Bayes, uh, the business um, uh, ministry in UK government and they would carry out the, the notification process. So we're building up that case. I think there's been a period when UK government wasn't keen on, on the notification process because they didn't think it would be uh, relevant or appropriate in light of Brexit negotiations, Brexit itself. But considering the extension, um, they are now minded to forward that, and we will um, pass that to them for the interests of uh, the Commission, European Commission. Uh, contingency plans, if there's a change in circumstances, if there is a Brexit, we won't go into all of that, but there's also um, arrangements in place, as I understand it from the UK government, about where we would notify to if it's not the European Commission. All right, thank you. Uh, now Gordon MacDonald. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, evidence to the committee uh, has uh, suggested that there isn't the level of demand um, that was envisaged in the uh, economy at the moment. Um, we also heard from Rob uh, Hunter of the Development uh, Bank of, of Wales uh, suggesting that the £200 million uh, that's envisaged to be um, invested each year is about the right level for Scotland. Can, can you tell me um, what your feelings are on... Uh, matching the supply and demand of funds, that £200 million a year, whether it is right under the current circumstances? I think that clearly we'll have to consider how we finance the bank and the capitalisation of the bank from year to year as resources allow, having set out the £2 billion capitalisation over the 10-year period. Exactly how we profile that will be determined by the resources that we have uh, available budget to budget within that aspiration, already having announced the Building Scotland Fund and, and, and precursor funds to, to the bank being established itself and they are being administered. Then, of course, are the other funds that will come from other places, Scottish uh, Investment Bank, um, that, that will form part of, of the finances. So I wouldn't set it out as rigidly as £200 million a year, as I say. I think the, the, the profile may vary year to year, naturally. In terms of demand, we'll want to make sure that 
there is demand, folk queuing up to the door, if you like, so that they can take advantage of the financial products that would be available. Uh, and to help stimulate that demand, we would want to engage uh, the enterprise agencies and SFT, and of course the banks as appropriate as well, because the purpose of this is to give additionality, not to crowd out the financial products that banks are currently providing. So recognising where there's ga gaps in the economy and gaps in the market right now, I think we want to focus on that to try and stimulate the demand. And then I think the attention, coverage and awareness that the bank hopefully will enjoy and we will encourage and stimulate will ensure that there is that demand. And when we look at the transformational nature of the bank, trying to provide that uh, patient finance, that patient capital, is a different kind of product that some of the banks we would um, traditionally use. So I think for all of those reasons, there will be demand. We may have to stimulate that by raising awareness. And then I think success will breed success. And as I say, I've described the investment pattern that, that um, will vary from year to year. Then we can respond accordingly. If that's helpful. Yeah. Um, I'm, again, l looking at the demand side, the committee heard from Rob Hunter that the Development Bank of Wales had an aim to reach 80 million of investment by 2022, but they achieved that in the first two years. Is there any reason why the demand profile in Scotland would be any different from Wales? Hey, no. It, it, well, the economies are. are clearly different. Some of the challenges we'll be facing uh, will be different and how we choose to target our missions, you know, might be really good in terms of scale ups for high, high growth companies. Um, so I, I want to say that we're learning from Wales, we're learning from the British Business Bank and we're learning from the Green Investment Bank. But what we are doing is different from all of them. It's unique to Scotland's economic circumstances, our own landscape. Um, but hopefully we can have that, uh, that, that demand and that investment. In relation to other investment funds that I'm familiar with at the moment, indeed the committee is very familiar with, there has been an issue right now around Brexit uncertainty impacting on investment plans being deferred and sometimes people not willing to co-invest at, at the moment because of that Brexit economic uncertainty. Now, if that is resolved, then um, I, I think that there will be... Uh, even more demand for those kind of products if we get beyond this uh, Brexit uncertainty phase. That, that's just a point around evidence I've seen around current uh, financial tools not being deployed because of a lack of willingness to co-invent or, or the uncertainty or investment develop at this point in time. But we'll continue to learn from the others. And just my final point, um, the British Business Bank have recently established a new demand development unit. Um, and I know that uh, Scottish Investment Bank works closely with the British Business Bank. Is there anything we can learn or copy or from this new unit that's been set up by the British Business Bank? Yeah, of course we'll take the good practice from them. In my early days as Finance Secretary, I engaged with the British Business Bank. Of course, we don't want to crowd out the BBB either. Uh, we want it. British Business Bank to keep investing in Scotland and supporting Scottish business. What we're about is the additionality, um, but of course we can pick up their practice in terms of what they are trying to achieve. What we will have is mission specific to Scotland's economy, of course, and that's where we add that additionality, that, that particular focus. But if there's practical measures for raising awareness, uh, particularly targeting SMEs as well, or scale-ups, uh, then I think that would be particularly uh, useful for us. But having convened uh, Scotland's Banking and Economy Forum as well, I'm trying to ensure that we've good relationships with the banks and use an intelligent approach to provide resource and finance uh, where maybe it's not totally there at the moment. So yes, we'll learn from the British Business Bank uh, and the unit that they've created. Thank you so much. Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, we've heard from those involved in setting up the bank that the bank won't act as the originator of funding opportunities. It will rely on opportunities uh, referred to it by the existing uh, enterprise agencies, Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands. Given the significant additional funding available from the bank, does that mean that the resources, budget and staffing levels of the enterprise agencies will increase to cope with the additional work? I think some of these issues have yet to be decided fully in terms of who transfers, what transfers and what resources where. I want to look very closely at that. I don't want any duplication. I know it's a, a matter that Dean Lockhart has mentioned in the chamber before. We don't want duplication. We don't want clutter. 
We want a really potent, targeted national investment bank. Uh, that will leave the enterprise agencies with their functions and SFT. So we'll look very closely at how we align our efforts, our organisations and our staff. And right now we're working on a, a single point of entry for business support as well. So this is about you know, essentially decluttering. So, so I think the way the question was framed, will the bank have a cost in an administration and then do I add to the enterprise agencies? Rather, we will look at right across the the infrastructure and the landscape and say what fits best where and how can we address duplication and make sure we're getting an absolute maximum output for those public finances. Thank you. Just to follow up on the question of alignment, the strategic board was set up two years ago to, over, to further align the activities of the enterprise agencies. Will the strategic board therefore sit on top of the bank and oversee and make, uh, the activities of the bank to ensure what you talk about, that, that full alignment? Really good question, actually, because what I, in terms of the structure and the governance uh, of of the bank uh, that I have before me, we are proposing, as well as the bank, of course, the board. There's ministerial accountability. There's parliament. There's audit Scotland. There's the advisory group, which I'm proposing to advise uh, ministers. But the strategic board is providing. Um, advice around all government's agencies. This is a public body. The bank is proposed to be a public body and a PLC, so I think its relationship will be different. But to assume that the strategic board will take no interest uh, uh, in the bank would be wrong. But I'm trying not to make the lines of accountability too cluttered. There will be very clear lines of accountability for the bank. So I think it may, be, it may well be able to give advice around the landscape of the agencies, and I'll give further thought, but I don't want the bank to be uh, responding to too many um, sources of leadership when the purpose was to, to declutter and bring it um, together. But I think it will continue to provide uh, recommendations around bringing the government's agencies together that Mr Lockhart is very familiar with. And just a final question on demand, if I may. The Scottish Growth Scheme was set up a couple of years ago to uh, invest up to £500 million in the Scottish economy. Can you give us an approximation of how much has been funded under the Scottish Growth Scheme to date? Well, I'd rather do that in writing so I get the figure absolutely right. I think I committed to give the committee an update in any event, and I'll give you line by line, portfolio by portfolio investment figures. The issue that we've faced, um, as Mr Lockhart's aware, is um, some of the schemes took a wee while to set up. Some of it's down to demand. Some of it is genuinely down to, uh, as I was touching upon uh, earlier, um, investment plans been put on hold or the lack of co-investment. Um, but essentially, am I still confident that the half a billion pounds that we committed to in the programme for government will be um, allocated over the term, yes, I am, but I'll write to the committee so that you have each portfolio's um, amounts allocated to date, if that's helpful, because I know I had committed to give the committee an update on that. Thank you. Thank you. It's important to say, but I, I think the point is fair, that we want to learn the lessons to make sure, back to the earlier point about demand, uh, stimulating demand, raising awareness. So, as I say, that there's almost a queue at the door as we're uh, ready to go. Good. Well, now, Andy Whiteman. Thanks very much, Convener. First of all, just a sort of technical question. Uh, why is it necessary to uh, establish this bank via primary legislation on the basis that Scottish ministers already own mm -hmm. Scottish Water, uh, David McBrains, etc.? You, you could set up a bank, if you wished, without legislation. What, what's the technical reason for the necessity of primary legislation? I'm happy to turn to the lawyer to say why it is so, but civil servants are quite good at saying because you have to minister. It's more, more technical uh, than that, but essentially it gives us the instruction, the basis. And I think it also gives the enduring nature of the bank, if it's setting out the parameters, uh, the function, uh, and it gives us the ability to, to capitalise by way of resources. Then it begs the question, well, what's different to before? Well, the scale of the bank, uh, bringing it together, and as I say, if we get the um, dispensations, then it gives the bank further financial flexibility uh, that current agencies we have um, don't um, enjoy. So there are benefits from it being established in legislation. But maybe um, Fraser would like to say more about the legal underpinning. Yeah, I mean, I think there's um, part of an issue really around just the, the democratic imprimatur behind the bank, they were talking about an institution that's going to be vested with very large sums of public money. 
and therefore it's attractive in a democracy to have the parliament have an opportunity to shape that institution. So rather than the government going away and drawing up the articles, this parliament has, through this bill process, an opportunity to influence the structure and the operation of the bank. And indeed, beyond the bill process, um, we have the mechanism for amending the entrenched provisions in the Bank's Articles Association, which are subject to a parliamentary scrutiny procedure, which, again, the government would have no mechanism to create but through the vehicle of primary legislation. So there's the ongoing role for Parliament as well that we really need the primary legislation to put in place. My, my question really was about necessity, not desirability. I understand the desirability. I'm grateful we have a bill. Um, I mean, I'm advised that it's elements to do with Section 17 on finance, providing grants, loans and guarantees that are prohibited by the Scotland Act. But if, you, if you're not... I, I think prohibited would be an overstatement of the position, but there is a question about how much public money the Scottish Government can expend without very direct statutory cover. Budget Acts, to some extent, provide that, but this is on a scale that goes beyond that kind of typical spend. If I can just say again, I think I mentioned it as part of my introduction, just, just to the question, uh, the power to capitalise the bank is clear as part of the bill. OK. Well, if, if, if you have further thoughts on the necessity to have legislation, what, what makes it? And the bank's a pretty good reason to legislate for a bank. Yes, no, I suppose my fundamental question is you could go ahead and do this without legislation, or, or, or could you? Or what's stopping you? If you can come back with us, that's, that's, that's well, we fine. Can. David, you want to add, follow? I'd, I'd very briefly. I, I, think that, I think the message your <clears throat> assessment is Scottish ministers could uh, create a, a, an organisation that could take on many of the functions um, with both limits and, and, and scope, um, exactly as you describe. The decision that's been made and the, the, the advice we've received is that in order to capitalise that company, um, of the scale that ministers intend, you would need to have legislation. So that the, the, the central need for this legislation is to give ministers the power to capitalise the bank, not to create it as such. So that ministers do not have at the moment to capitalise to, to, such an institution? Yes. Okay, thanks very much. Um, on the um, vision and the implementation plan, the vision, the recommendation number one was the vision for the bank should be to provide finance and act to catalyse private investment to achieve a step change in growth for the Scottish economy by powering innovation and accelerating the move to a low carbon, high tech, connected, globally competitive and inclusive economy. Um, I don't think you'd find much disagreement about that, but witnesses have questioned whether in fact that bold vision, as it were, is actually translated into the language of Section 2 on the bank's objects that shall be, shall be uh, in the uh, articles. And there's also been questions raised about um, 2A, inclusive and sustainable economic growth, with the um, Poverty and Inequality Commission just this week um, saying that government needs to do more to define exactly what that means and how to measure it. So um, I'm just wondering if you've had any further thoughts about the objects and whether you actually consider that the objects do faithfully reflect the recommendation on the vision and the implementation plan? Well, I'm content that we'll absolutely achieve the vision for the bank through the objects and, of course, the missions. The missions will be absolutely crucial here. Um, and I think in the ancillary objects, it does cover some of the areas that Andy Whiteman has just mentioned, which includes investing in inclusive and sustainable economic growth promoting and developing the activities of enterprises where a lack of financial investment is holding back economically viable commercial activity, promoting and developing the activities of small and medium-sized enterprises, creating and shaping markets through the provision of patient capital, and contributing to the achievement of the Scottish Government's economic policy objectives, which does include boosting competitiveness, but also tackling inequality. And uh, I think it sets that out. I think the missions it will be critical, and I think they will absolutely speak to those uh, areas further, including uh, low carbon. Um, now, maybe we'll come back to the formulation of the, the missions. I have some ideas around that that I would like to discuss with the committee. But I do believe the ambitions in the consultation and the implementation plan will feature. Of course, it's fair to say I'm looking at a chart of responsibility and a table of the the bank's governance, but right across the Articles of Association, the shareholder framework document, the missions, 
uh, and then that will lead to the investment strategy, business plan, ethical statement, so on and so forth. It will absolutely want to direct this bank in the way that Parliament would want it to, and Government would certainly want it to. So I don't think there's any risk of the, uh, the intentions being lost here. The question more is that Recommendation 1 is quite a visionary statement. Um, the language of Section 2 is the dry language of Articles and Memorandum of Association. Um, uh, I don't doubt that you share the vision set out in Recommendation 1, but in 10, 15 years' time, that may not be the vision of an administration. Um, so I suppose I'm just wondering whether one can, um, if that vision is important, I believe it is, I think we all believe it is, um, is there any way of incorporating that in the, in the bill to make it clear about what this bank is actually for? You see, I think, well, I, I think the, the bill does do that, but the bill is essentially enabling us, it's building the structure the bank will be enduring, it will be long term, I think it will be a permanent feature of our financial landscape, but I think the missions need to be adaptable. I think that the uh, articles, of course, there are some that are uh, entrenched in terms of how we uh, deliver the bank, um, there is that parliamentary uh, involvement as well. So I do believe that the, I think we have to be quite adept and agile to circumstance as well, and I think that's why it's important that the missions aren't outlined in the bill, so that if we were to change or amend, we shouldn't have to return to Parliament with primary legislation every time we wanted to change, but the bill has to give us the structure, the enablement to be able to go on with the bank. There are many, many other areas about what practically it will do that I don't think is right for legislation, but should feature any other devices that I've spoken about. Come, come in, uh, you, you mentioned the mission and the role of Parliament. so. Um, I mean, you, you rightly draw our attention to the fact that the entrenched provisions uh, can only be modified by um, if, a, if, a, if a resolution has been laid and approved by, by Parliament. That's not the case, however, with the, with the missions. Uh, and I'm just wondering whether you think there's any case for the missions having given how central they appear to be to the role of the bank, whether they should be subject to any parliamentary scrutiny, at least, or or indeed resolution? I don't think they should, but I have an idea around that. In terms of the, the missions, I think it's right that government can go on with its job as an executive and have that relationship with the bank and there'll be that degree of independence, but we'll set out the parameters within which it should be operating. Illustrative missions have been set out. That includes demographic change. That includes uh, the low-carbon economy. Um, I led the work on behalf of the government for the National Performance Framework, which is the purpose, the mission, the outcomes, the, the indicators, if you like, for uh, purpose for, for the government. And essentially, we tried to make it about the country as well. And it didn't require an affirmative vote by Parliament. That was a mission for the whole country. But the way we were able to take it forward was quite inclusive. It was through engagement, consultation, stakeholder round table cross-party basis. So what I would like to do with the missions is the same kind of approach. So I would commit to a roundtable approach. There's extensive consultation already underway. But rather than have a parliamentary vote and an unnecessary, uh, vote and an unnecessary division on it, I don't think it's for Parliament to, uh, to, to have a vote on it, but I would like to engage Parliament with it. So the same as I did for the National uh, Performance Framework, I'm very keen to have a cross-party approach just to look at the missions and, and refine them. If I can get, in terms of the national performance framework, the likes of Myrtle Fraser and Patrick Harvey to agree on the purpose of the country, then surely we can approach the missions for the bank in that same kind of consensual, constructive basis. But there are other stakeholders that we must engage with as well. So although it is ultimately uh, for government, I do want to take a collaborative approach to the creation of the missions, having already published some of the illustrative missions, but that's not the end of the matter. Okay, thanks. And in regard to the, to the missions, I mean, uh, the bill says you'll send a document to the, to the bank setting out new missions or modifying or, or ending missions, uh, as it were. Missions, I think, are designed to be fairly long term. And I'm just wondering if you can give a, an indication of how substantial, how subst what proportion of the bank's resource uh, let us say, shall be devoted to the uh, pursuit of missions as opposed to uh, other um, financial uh, products that it may develop routinely? I would want to set a percentage. It's a good question, but that, I suppose, would feature in the investment strategy and the business plan particularly. Um, but I would expect those missions to 
for, the, for them to be transformative, to absorb a lot of the energy and resource of the bank. So we're directing the bank to engage in those missions. That's not to say that every single investment would be exclusive as part of the missions, but you would expect that to be directing the energies of the bank. But I wouldn't say a specific percentage, um, but we'll get further information from the investment strategy and the business plan that the investment bank would lead on, and then it would be for ministers to review. So yes, I'm not looking for a specific percentage, I was just looking for a, a kind of indication, because given the importance that's been attached to mission-orientated finance, and I'm looking particularly at the paper that was produced for the government by Mariana Matsukata and Laurie McFarlane in March 2019, um, you see the mission-based finance as a substantial part of this bank's activity. I do. When yeah. I said I think it'll absorb the energy and resources of the bank, my indication is that I expect there to be a real focus on the missions, yes. That's helpful. Thanks very much. And, and finally, um, on ethics, we've had some sort of discussion around um, ethics. I'm just wondering um, whether you feel there needs to be any um, uh, uh, legislative provisions around ethics of the bank, or that's something you're content to leave to the board? E, well, neither of those options. I don't intend to uh, legislate um, specifically on what we would define as ethical, uh, but there will be an ethical statement, and then the, the, the contrast here is that I wouldn't just leave it to the board, although the, it's appropriate that the board leads on the ethical statement, it would be for ministers to review it. Uh, so naturally, ministers would engage. Um, and actually, in the shareholder framework document and earlier than that, I'm sure ministers would want to give a view on what we felt was the spirit of you know, ethical um, a, a investment and practice. That said, of course, the, a, as a public body, it would be bound by things like the uh, public sector equality duty, um, representation on public boards, so on and so forth. So there will be some already existing legislation that would be relevant to a public body but we would review the ethical statement. And I wouldn't just leave it to the bank to compose an ethical statement I would propose to engage beforehand. The statement's not a, a legislative requirement. No, but the way the question was framed is, would I legislate? And I said no, and then I, but then I was asked, would I leave it to the board? And I also said no, okay. and g then gave the appropriate answer. Very impressed, Minister. Thank you very much indeed. Um, that's all for me at the moment. Colin Beattie. Um, there's a couple of areas I'd like to explore. The first is about the targeted rate of return. The bill's policy memorandum states that the bank will deliver against the target rate of return set by the Scottish ministers. Now, we've taken a fair bit of evidence on this, and there's a range of approaches taken for national development banks. Some banks have target rates of returns, and others don't. What, what's the reasoning behind having a target rate of return for SNIB? I suppose it's uh, to set a target, but do you know, I wouldn't, I, and I think a target, well, let, let me frame this very carefully. I think we have to bear in mind this is not about economic commercial profit return, although it's good that what is raised is then actually reinvested, although ministers have the option of dividend as well. But because we're putting those um, societal, those transformational, those environmental issues there as well, it's not all just about the rate of return. Um, I, you know, others uh, have one. I think it's appropriate for the uh, Scottish National Investment Bank to have one, but I wouldn't be bound to it as giving the impression that the rate of return is more important than the other considerations. Actually transforming our economy in the way that we're describing earlier, around low carbon, around um, demographic change, around the scale-ups and support of our, of our economy and the SMEs. It's all important as well. So I think it's important to have a... Um, uh, rate of return. Uh, we'll engage with the bank on that, uh, but I don't want it to be overly restrictive or give the impression that that is the, 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 the kind of matter of primacy here. It's not. It's about transforming our economy and adding to it. The other issue here to bear in mind, of course, is it's the nature of patient finance, that there might not be short-term or immediate return. It might be uh, long-term before um, investments can uh, return uh, resource. So I think there's a number of considerations. It's appropriate to have one, but we won't be absolutely beholden to that as the only measure of success. Is there then a point in having a, a rate of return? I mean, you've highlighted quite a number of uh, issues that would indicate that a, a rate of, target rate of return might not be appropriate. 
I think it's important to have one, but not be totally beholden by it, as long as we are bearing in mind the other considerations that the bank will have and the missions that we're setting them. I think it's good to have there as a benchmark, but not be a, an absolute prisoner to that rate of return. I'm sure it will be used uh, to compare with, with other financial institutions as well, uh, but I think we'll all look very reasonably at what's appropriate. We don't have a proposed rate of return yet, because this, of course, is just about legislation for the bank. It's much closer to its operation, and then we'll set that out in the relevant document. Consideration being given as to what the likely target rate of return will be? Not yet, although we're looking very closely at the rate of return um, with others. So I haven't not, set that out. Is there not danger if a rate of return is set that human nature being human nature, everything gets measured against that? It becomes the totem that everyone uh, operates against. It's a fair question um, that Mr. Beat is asking, but I'm trying to express that we should have one so that we have another. Um, metrics of success and, and benchmark, but we mustn't be beholden to it because of the missions that we're trying to establish for the bank. So it should be there and present. We should be mindful of it, but it mustn't be the North Star, you know, the only thing that we follow. Leading from that is the other point I wanted to talk about, which is uh, break even and uh, operating costs. Uh, break even point is a, a timeline of 2023, 2024. Now, the bank's going to be investing in uh, firms whose needs for capital aren't adequately set, serviced already by the market, and the reasons for the lack of that investment are often complex. Is it likely that the bank's higher risk profile is going to impact on the potential break-even date, and what would that mean? Well, it might. It's, it's likely, it's possible, but depending on what's invested in, when there is financial return on um, the state of the economy at the time or where there is success, whether it be uh, around the, uh, the missions or the profiles of investment, what we choose to do around the economic cycle, or it relates to my earlier point about in terms of uh, availability of resources, uh, how quickly we can capitalise the bank, all of those determinants will then lead to the issue of how soon uh, it achieves break-even. Clearly, as Finance Secretary, I want that to be as soon as possible. But actually, if it's stimulating the economy uh, and delivering the necessary investments that is enhancing and improving our economy as Economy Secretary, uh, then I'll welcome that stimulation. So we've set out in the financial memorandum what we think the cost to be. We've certainly set out what we think the benefits to be. Um, but it will depend on the investment profile, uh, the returns, and I think the, the nature and state of the economy at the time. Would break-even be measured as a, a book entry or actual cash in the bank, so to speak? In other words, we were talking previously about patient capital, which means that you know, it could be years before you're actually able to crystallise any profit that might be made in that investment, but you would be booking it every year, obviously. So... Would it be a book? Would it be a, a book break, break even, or is it actually cash? I think um, I was asked before. I can't remember if it was this committee or another committee. What is success for the National Investment Bank? And I actually said to allow investments to happen that wouldn't otherwise happen. So I'm not seeing the National Investment Bank as a cash cow that can then contribute to the fiscal coffers, as nice as that would be, it's more about transforming our economy, stimulating investment, providing financial support, where maybe it's not there right now, uh, transforming the economy to direct more efforts around that demographic challenge, that environmental challenge of the transition to the low carbon economy and the scale ups. So uh, in terms of it being self-financing and the ability to reinvest its returns, I want that to be as soon as possible, uh, but I see its contribution to the economy to be much greater than the ability for ministers to take a dividend. That's not the motivation of the bank. So the sooner it can be self-financing, the better, naturally. But the bigger prize is what it can do for the economy and what it can do for business support and what it can do to transform our economy. That's what I see as success, investments that wouldn't otherwise be happening, happening. So the target date for break-even is more notional than actual? Because of the range of determinants that I've set out, I suppose so, yes. And just one last question, just to finish up. Um, obviously, SNIB's intended to be a, a, a cornerstone for the Scottish economy in the future, and hopefully something that's going to 
be with us for a very long time. Are you satisfied that uh, the way it's being set up, that it's going to be free from future political interference, so to speak, you know, changes of regime and so on? Well, I don't know, because I haven't seen your committee report yet, so I'm not sure how much you want to interfere um, as a committee, first of all. Um, in all seriousness, uh, convener, the way we are trying to structure the bank and the arrangements uh, around it, I think it, 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 is, it does get the balance right. So a PLC, but a public body, with the relevant accountability, transparency, governance arrangements, advisory boards, so they can hear from different parts of society, uh, ministers can direct and engage as appropriate. But I think it's really important, all the advice and evidence that we have heard, that it'll achieve more if it's independent, it's as independent as possible. And that's why there's, but it is public money, so there's all the appropriate checks and, and balances, but there is that operational independence. And in setting out the missions, we can direct the bank's efforts and energies. In setting out the shareholder framework uh, document, um, then I think it gives us that assurance on how it will operate. Uh, we're clear that we're setting out the Articles of Association, including those entrenched articles, and then other policies ministers will be able to review. So I do think we've got the balance right, but of course we'll continue to engage with the committee in terms of uh, any suggestions the committee may have around that. But I do believe the balance is right so that the bank endures beyond any parliamentary term or term of finance secretary or otherwise. Angela Constance. Thank you, Convener, and uh, good morning to the Cabinet Secretary. Um, he's probably aware that both in gender and close the gap raised serious concerns about the equality impact assessment, um, in essence saying that it lacked substance, that it was incomplete, and that the analysis was somewhat cursory. So. Uh, I would like to know how the Cabinet Secretary intends to um, interfere uh, to rectify that matter. Thank you. Of course, Ministers are perfectly entitled at this stage, and as is Parliament, to, to create the very bank. Uh, so I wouldn't see that element as interference at all. Uh, I have seen the, the evidence from Close the Gap and Engender. Uh, there's officials meetings uh, with uh, organisations to absolutely go through the concerns so that that can then shape and inform future work, uh, and that will feature. I'm very mindful, though, and I've just touched upon this earlier, that as a public body, the public body, the, the bank, uh, will be duty-bound to follow the duties that are set out. So maybe some of the elements around equality or the duties weren't expressed in this bill because it's required de facto of any bill or any um, public sector body. So there's the expectation that that would all have been delivered and complied with without reference to it because it's uh, the, the legal position as it stands, such as the Public Sector Equality Duty and other duties in the Equality Act uh, 2010. Um, but there will be further work as well on the social economic uh, deprivation work um, through the Fairer Scotland Duty Assessment. I understand that assessment's findings will be published at the end of the summer, so that will also feature in the various strands of work um, yet to come. So between the engagement with the organisations uh, to make sure that we get it right and also how we uh, direct and target and point the organisation itself, I want to make sure that we will cover the issues of a, an inclusive approach, inclusive economic growth, sustainability, equality and tackling inequality as well. And I think that they will feature essentially in the, in the missions, in the shareholder framework document. And then I would expect them to be in remuneration policy, investment strategy, the business plan and the ethical statement. I think it's right that they feature in those documents which ministers will be uh, reviewing. So if it was felt, and it clearly was by that evidence that there were gaps, then I want to work on that, including um, what we can do around the opportunity for those with protected uh, characteristics. So we will meet individually with the organisations and then we'll see uh, what further progress we can make over the course of the, the bill. But, but e maybe even more importantly than the bill itself, which just allows us to build the bank, but those strategic documents and directions in which equality should feature. OK, so would the Cabinet Secretary accept, therefore, that it is better to be explicit uh, whenever there's an opportunity to articulate what everybody is required to do in terms of advancing equality? 
I think that, and again, lawyers might be better placed to argue this. I think pieces of legislation cross-referencing other pieces of legislation can get quite messy. But what should absolutely feature for the avoidance of doubt is those legislative drivers, missions, objectives should absolutely feature in the other driving documents that I've suggested. So I, do, I don't think that legislation should be overly complex, but we all have to be bound by that which Parliament has stated we should do. But it absolutely must feature in the top level um, documents and direction that the bank would operate under. So yes, I do think we should be explicit in how we do our business and how we operate and what we're trying to achieve, yes. So the word equality uh, is not mentioned uh, in the bill. So I'm wondering, how does the omission uh, of equality from the bill fit with uh, inclusive growth as an outcome, um, and more importantly, with the raison d'etre of the bill, which, as you say, Cabinet Secretary, is to transform the economy by increasing not just competitiveness, but also reducing inequality. The bill directs uh, people to the government's economic strategy, which absolutely does mention tackling inequality. Uh, the government's economic strategy does focus on inclusive economic growth and uh, greater equality. So I think the bill, I think the bill is, we've tried to keep the bill as tight as possible to be about enabling the bank to be created. And all those other documents, as I say, from the Articles of Association, the Mission and the Framework document, and all the other policies should feature the uh, objectives and the language that's right and appropriate. But for the avoidance of doubt, just because the word equality isn't mentioned in the bill, it will absolutely be mentioned where appropriate in all the other documents. And the government's economic strategy that the bill you know, references the bank too does t does mention tackling inequality as a key part of the government's economic strategy, and that's tackling inequality in every sense, not just you know um, financial inequality. But you're accepting that visibility and clarity is important. Absolutely, accept that. Okay, um, can I just go on to ask about remuneration, uh, convener? Um, the committee has heard. Um, more shown a written evidence, uh, mixed evidence about the bank's remuneration uh, policy. Um, on the one hand, uh, the bank will be operating in the uh, financial sector, and for some people, they say they would expect that to be reflected in terms and conditions, uh, etc. However, other evidence has uh, pointed to the fact that this is a public body accountable to taxpayers, uh, there's a need to deliver uh, value for money, and that public support for the bank uh, and its policies uh, remains uh, important. So I wondered uh, what the Cabinet Secretary's views uh, in and around remuneration policy are. Well, convener, Ms Constance has given a very fair articulation of the issues that we'll be wrestling with. A, as, a, as a government, as a parliament, about what we want the bank to achieve. It's, it, it will be a, essentially a you know, PLC, but a public body. We will be wrestling with making sure that we can attract uh, the right people to, to operate it as a bank, but also, a, insofar as possible, work within the public sector pay policy. But that won't be, that won't be possible for, for every a member of staff. A, I would echo the comments that the First Minister has made in this regard, and she said, if this bank is to be successful, we want to attract the top talent to run it, and we need to be able to attract that talent and equally. Uh, we live in a climate and a culture where there can be public concern about salaries that are overly inflated. In shorthand, that bonus culture, we don't want to uh, obviously have those kind of concerns in a public loaned organisation that is there for the public good. So I think as the remuneration a policy a, is, is set out, then we'll need to bear in mind absolutely the bank will work within the fair work principles, will be a living wage employer. I know that all of that has been welcomed, but I think to secure the um, level of staff that we will undoubtedly require, higher levels of remuneration will be required for some posts. But we'll look very closely at the British Business Bank, which is similar in this regard, uh, in terms of their pay policy, to then determine uh, what's right for the Scottish National Investment Bank, which will be commercially minded but publicly accountable, and that is a matter we'll give a, a great deal of uh, thought to. Um, so it will be a balance between people with the right skills and experience 
but also respect to public sector pay policy, where I know the vast majority of staff um, would uh, fit within. Now, the remuneration policy um, on an elite and the recruitment of bank staff will be for the bank to lead, but clearly Minister will set out a, a view on this in a direction if appropriate. So we'll give this further thought based on the evidence of equivalent organisations such as the British Business Bank, a, mindful of the public sector pay policy, but a recognition that it's not just another public body that will need to attract the right staff. So there'll be a balance here, as Ms Constance uh, has uh, articulated. Well, what are your views on performance-related pay? I don't want to see a, a bonus culture within the bank. I think that that would be a, an inappropriate driver. I want the bank to be inspired and energised by the missions, a, and I wouldn't want them to be encouraged to have a bonus culture. For as long as I've been finance secretary, I've not encouraged a bonus culture within the civil service or the public sector pay policy. And I wouldn't like to see it within the bank. I think it creates the, the wrong type of cultures. So it will be focused on delivery with appropriate remuneration and the structure that I've set out. OK, thanks, Convener. Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Convener. I wonder whether I could pick up on two issues already covered with the Minister before I move to my question. Um, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's invitation for the Committee to interfere. Um, I view that as positive encouragement to do so. Does he have in mind a particular role for the Committee in that interference, or do we have a blank sheet that we can do what we will with it? I'm totally open, accountable, oh. transparent to this committee, and it's no holds barred from Jackie Bailey, as always. You don't let me down, Cabinet Secretary. Um, you can look with interest at our report then. Um, the other thing that, that you touched on in reply to Gordon MacDonald is about stimulating demand and talking about the challenge posed by Brexit. I think you forecast my question, which is that the Scottish European Growth Co-Investment Programme only has managed to allocate 3.25 million out of a total of 200 million. Um, I wonder whether you think that Brexit has been the cause of that slow take up in demand. The businesses have been telling me that um, investment plans have been deferred because of Brexit. And that's one of the, the reasons for, for companies holding off. I've been meeting with businesses as well that are keen to invest in the UK and Scotland. And because it's very hard to answer the Brexit question, what will the position be? Um, some companies are holding off investment. Now, for that reason, if a company's holding off investment, it's, it's therefore no surprise that um, uh, some companies are not seeking that, that, that funding to, to go ahead with investment plans. So I think it is having a material impact on the economy, yes. And I, I accept that, but the thing that absolutely confuses me about this is the co-investment programme was announced to great fanfare maybe two and a half, three years ago almost, and it was set up to help businesses grow in the face of Brexit. Isn't it the case, therefore, that you didn't do your homework in setting the fund up? No, not at all. There's no need for the pejorative language in terms of that. It takes time to establish uh, funds, investment funds. There's got to be due diligence. We've got to make sure that we can reach out to those potential investors. I absolutely understand all of that and agree with the Cabinet Secretary, but, but in your evidence to the committee just moments earlier, you said part of the problem was Brexit and it was stopping right. people investing. This fund was set up by the Scottish Government to deal with the problem of Brexit. So the contention I'm That's making right. is you didn't understand the market when you set the fund up. Not at all. We committed to financial support. The question I was asked earlier is would we okay. fulfil that commitment around half a billion pounds of financial support? And I've said yes, we will. I've said I'll provide further information to the committee on the profile of that. Um, now, we can create a fund and we can offer loan and equity uh, but that doesn't force companies to take the financial products that we have. And I've also been clear to government agencies that we can be creative, that in terms of doing our homework, if we have financial products that uh, there isn't enough demand for, then create bespoke products. Let's see how we can support companies if they want a different kind of financial product. But the nature of, of financial transactions, for example, it can only be loans or equity. And companies, of course, will always take free money before loans and equity. Naturally, anyone would take grant before loans and equity. But where we're providing loans and equity, because of the nature of the economy or the nature of risk or financial 
um, uncertainty companies may not be willing to, to take up specific projects. And in terms of the Scottish European Growth Investment Programme, of course, we'll have to comply within the rules that's appropriate to use those resources for. It's always been my position, of course, as Finance Secretary, never to lose any resources either. So if people won't take the financial products that we've got, we can see how we can amend them so that we can provide further support to the private sector. But I'm afraid Brexit uncertainty has been raising its head since uh, the referendum itself and having a material impact on the investment decisions of companies and potential investors. It's just that you brought forward that fund in light of all of that. So can I just pick you up on, on your latter point, which was if it's not working, you'll seek to reallocate the money. Are we to take it then that the Scottish European Growth Co-Investment Programme is coming to an end? It's going to be altered? Is the money going to be reallocated? No, no, I'm still intending to use it. But what okay. I'm saying is if there's any prospect of Scotland losing out on finance, I'll make sure that we can adapt so that we never lose a penny that Scotland's entitled to. It's just unfortunate, of course, that thanks to the efforts of the UK government, we might be on track to lose out on substantial sums of money if there's not a, a resolution to the financial guarantees coming from the UK government because of the funds that we've enjoyed from the European Union. So okay. what I'm saying is... I have financial products. If they can work better, I'll try and make them better so that they're used in uh, support of the Scottish economy. Excellent. Thank you. Your implementation plan states that a balanced scorecard will be developed between the bank and the Scottish Government, and that would set out the requirement and measurement of non-financial returns. Can the Cabinet Secretary point to where this features in the bill or in any supporting document? Well, we haven't... Um put much detail in the bill. We're still working on this uh, so that we have both within the, the framework, the stakeholder framework document, I think it should uh, feature within there. Um, we will set financial targets for the bank through that uh, stakeholder agreement. Um, we will cover it uh, in the missions, covering key socio-economic uh, challenges for the bank. And I think as part of that, we'll have the financial and non-financial returns. Um, as a patient um, um, stakeholder, then clearly we'll give time for resources to return to the bank. Um, I would expect it to feature within the business plan, the inv investment strategy uh, as well, in terms of reference to that balance uh, scorecard. Um, and it will build on the Treasury's Green Book guidance, which would develop a specific approach suited to a mission-orientated uh, development bank. OK, the, the, there is nothing that we can find in the bill or indeed the supporting document, so I'm, I'm encouraged by what the Cabinet Secretary is saying. Um, I would be very keen, if we're going to set up an institution like this, that the non-financial returns are something that government prioritises and that there is clear sight and measurement of them. Um, so if we can see the, the kind of, whether it's guidance that's developing, the business plan, the earlier sight the committee has of your intentions, the more confident we would feel about these returns. I think, I think that's a fair point, convener. I still don't think, and I don't think Jackie Bailey is making this point, that it should be in the primary legislation to create the bank. I think we're agreed on that. But it should absolutely feature the expectation uh, within the um, stakeholder framework document. That's clear. That's the relationship between bank and government. Uh, and then feature elsewhere as appropriate to capture those financial and non-financial matters. So I'll, I'll give that further thought as to how it features, uh, but I take the point that it's not for the primary legislation, but it should be, uh, back to Angela Constance's point, explicit elsewhere. Thank you, convener. John Mason. Yeah, thank you, uh, convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, you've mentioned the advisory group once or twice already this morning. I just wanted to ask you a little more about that. Um, I think the reality is we've had a variety of uh, witnesses giving us a variety of advice, some wanting the advisory group more kind of s separate, standalone, some wanting it more involved. So it was just to uh, kind of ask you around that area um, how you see the advisory group going. Am I right in saying that it would really be there to advise ministers rather than to advise the bank itself? Yes, that's correct. The intention is that the advisory group would be advising ministers, and clearly we have a relationship with the bank, eh, rather than the bank trying to look to too many different places, it is our view that the, the advisory group should be advising ministers, that's correct. So, so would there be no relationship directly between the advisory group and the bank? You know, I, I think we could give that further thought, but you know, whether, 
not saying that the advisory group should never meet the bank. I don't know they want to be too specific <coughs> about that, if that would be overly restrictive. But the purpose of the advisory group is to advise ministers, ultimately, who we direct to the bank through the missions, through the sh uh, shareholder framework, uh, through well the Act. Parliament will create, create the Act, and then we will hold the bank uh, to account as well. But, it, the, the, but the advisory group wouldn't be in the, in the Act, is that, is that correct? That's not the intention. No. No. Okay. Because it, yes, an advisory function, so um, we're not proposing to put yes. it in the act. No. And then the, the question has also arisen: you know, should somebody, perhaps the chair or some other member of the advisory group, also be on the board of the bank? Um, and again, I think we've had different views on that. Can you give us any th thought about your current thinking on that? Well, I think we could give further thinking around that um, in terms of the chair. Well, it's this. The proposal in the consultation paper was that one of the non-executive directors would be the chair of the advisory group to create the link between the thinking in the advisory group and also the connection to the board and its thinking. So that, well, that would, on the one hand, that would give a connection, yeah. but on the other hand, would that compromise the independence of the advisory group? Well, I, th I think it, it gives you the link that Mr Mason was asking about, but not the advisory group into the board, mm -hmm. but the board to the advisory group. Mm -hmm. I think the important point about the advisory group, though, is we, we want it to be reflective of Scotland, of the key economic interests. It can't be totally comprehensive and cover every sector, but we want it to inform um, the group itself that then informs uh, the ministers. But I think it will give that relationship um, direct to ministers. We want them to act as as our advisors in terms of the wider economy. And then there is that link from the board itself in terms of non-exec director. But they, of course, would be outnumbered by all the other members on the advisory group. I think we've been looking at a membership of around 20. Right. And we were open to that. Mm -hmm. But I think that's quite representative. Yes, and again, on, on membership, we have had you know a variety of thoughts and comments. I mean, one example, for example, was uh, nurses and social workers might be on the advisory group, which, you know, traditionally for a financial institution would not be the expectation or a requirement. But um, I think that it was an example of having a very wide group involved in the advisory group, including a lot of people who, who wouldn't have a financial background. So again, is that is that your kind of thinking? Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to create, you know, almost representative posts of a, of a sector, but, but the mission here will for it to be as representative as possible. And I think it goes back to um, Angela Constance's point around equality, representation, and, and who populates that board as well, um, so, or that group. Um, so we will look at how it's, how it's formed um, as we work towards its operation. Um, and I can provide further information to the committee. That's, not that's obviously not for this legislation, but it's absolutely for the operation of the bank. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. If I can just ask on a se slightly separate point, um, I mean, you explained earlier on that one of the reasons for setting the bank up legally the way you are is that that would give it kind of longevity and it should go through political cycles. I mean, we've used the word patient quite a lot, and, for example, you said patient stakeholder and we're talking about patient capital. I mean, are you optimistic that uh, the politicians, and I'm thinking of people like Jackie Bailey and... Dean Lockhart will be patient going forward, or do you think they will, on day one, be immediately asking for a high rate of return and mm -hmm. criticising you if they don't get it? Well, I, think, I think that's very unkind comments to <laughs> other <laughs> committee <laughs> members. <laughs> Although I think the analysis is probably 100% fair <laughs> that, that that ministers and the bank should be held to account. But it goes back to the earlier point that th this is not about. Um, necessarily raising revenue for, for government, nice as that would be. It's about helping us transform the economy, provide that financial support where it doesn't fully exist at the moment, and, and target some of the issues that could really help us out. We take, take one area such as renewables. If it levered in finance to the renewable sector to capitalise on our, our wonderful natural assets and our ability to create clean, green energy, then it's the kind of investment that will be transformational. So I think we'll all be enthusiastic about the bank's creation and we want to get it right. But of course, it will be held to a very high standard and, and, and that's admirable. Thank you very much. Speaking of Dean Lockhart.
Uh, thank you, Convener. I, I'm both patient and enthusiastic, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I wanted to address a couple of issues on missions. In, in uh, previous evidence sessions, there was some confusion over whether all funding made by the bank would be mission-based or whether the bank can lend outside of the core missions across all sectors as the Scottish Investment Bank currently does. Can the Cabinet Secretary please confirm? It, well, yes, we'll, we'll want the, the missions and we'll publish the illustrative missions. And I mean, arguably, they are quite wide, eh, but also focused. So focus on that inclusive, sustainable economic um, growth and emissions that we've, we've set out beneath that. Eh, to answer the question directly, the bank will be able to allocate resources out with the missions, but that will be for them to decide. You know, it will need to be within, of course, their ethical statement, within their investment strategy, within all those considerations and burdens that we put upon them. But it's not inconceivable or impossible that the bank would invest, because we won't be micromanaging the individual investments that the bank makes. It's not impossible that they'll invest out with the missions, but within those other policy parameters. Thank you. Let me give you one example raised uh, during uh, com previous committee sessions. Uh, would investment in the oil and gas sector, for example, be consistent with a low carbon mission for the bank? Well, it depends what the bid for funding is. So let's say it was oil and gas company diversifying from extraction into renewables, for example, or um, how you reduce emissions. So I think you'd have to look at the um, funding. It goes back to my earlier point around it be possible as long as it meets the other policy requirements that are an investment is made out with the specific um, missions, and it will be down to the nature of the application and the investment that's sought. And of course, the the bank will be looking at a balanced investment profile as well. You then come to a wider debate, um, which you know, over the course of the the building up the the bank's ethical statement as well. Um, around the, the restricted nature of what the bank may not be investing in. And again, we may have a view uh, on that. So I want to speculate too much what it can and can't invest in when this is about the legislation to build the bank and some of those matters will be for investment strategy or the ethical policy. Thank you. Um, Section 11 allows Scottish ministers to change the bank's mission statement by sending a document. Concern has been raised about perhaps mission statements being changed too often. Uh, there was some concern that perhaps mission statements might be changed every year uh, as part of the annual report. Would you think changing the mission statement every year would be too often, would not be appropriate? Yes, every year would be too often, clearly for patient finance and for a long-term economic strategy. If you were to change them every year, I think that would be too often. I think it should be flexible enough to change it as the economy demands, but it strikes me that a year would be too often, especially when uh, the bank will have a business plan and its own investment strategy. So I'd imagine that the uh, uh, missions are more uh, medium term than that kind of short term change them every year. How can the, the bank make those strategic long term investments if we were changing it every year? Yeah. And just on that point, you, you mentioned future proofing the bank uh, against changes in government, etc. Would you consider future proofing changing the mission statements in the legislation so that you could only, ministers could only change the statement, say, every two years to reflect your concerns about this long-term thinking? I think I, I really don't want to tie the legislation up and formulate or a unnecessary um, a parameters. So I get the intention behind the question, but I think any wise minister would, would know that it was counterproductive to be constantly or annually changing the missions, but I don't think we should necessarily tie our hands for what de facto, what clearly is common sense, uh, why isn't the right thing to do? I don't know if Dean Lockhart now feels an amendment coming on to the, <laughs> to, to the bill, but, but I'm sure Mr Lockhart understands the point here that you've asked me a direct question, I've answered it. Do I think I need to legislate for common sense? I don't think so. OK, we'll leave it at that point. Thank you. Jamie Halker johnson Thanks very much, Convener. Good morning. Um, the Im implementation plan notes that uh, SNIB will have a national mandate to realise benefits of investment at scale while maintaining regional reach to help businesses to realise their full economic potential. So um, last week we took uh, evidence from the Development Bank of Wales and Rob Hunter was very clear that maintaining or ensuring that regional approach is extremely important. So I was just wondering how uh, you'll ensure that 
happens with the with the bank that it has that regional approach rather than focusing perhaps on central belt or other areas well let me be clear i don't want the bank to just focus on the central belt or where you might think the economic clusters are because actually the bank can deliver for every part of the country i just mentioned that uh, just a moment ago the the uh, potential around uh, renewables. That's clearly on the island communities as well, coastal communities, rural communities. So I think the financial products that the bank can provide can touch every part of Scotland and there would be an expectation. Of course, sometimes there's a disproportionate positive effect uh, on on rural areas from what might be less resource in, uh, say, say in the large urban areas. So no, my expectation is that it can cover every part of the country, that its financial products will be open to every a part of the country, a, and it can have that geographic um, a, approach. And let's not worry about um, that, that physical issue. It's the accessibility of, of the bank. It won't be like a traditional bank where you rock up to the counter and ask for a loan. It's how you make those financial products uh, available intelligently. But we want to make sure it has that uh, national uh, locus. And I can also engage with uh, Business Gateway and uh, local authorities as well uh, in terms of ensuring that the bank has a national uh, reach. And similarly, we can um, uh, support uh, the deployment of those resources across the country. And the South of Scotland uh, Development Enterprise Agency that we now have is you know, further addition to the economic landscape that's very welcome. So my, my ambition is to make sure that it speaks to the whole country and its financial products will work for the whole country. Okay, the suggestion I got there was that despite it still being consulted or still being considered, but you wouldn't see uh, the bank having regional offices or local offices? It's, it's not the kind of bank where, I mean, accommodation is yet to be determined. That is a matter for how it looks operationally once we've got to the um, issue about um, who's exactly doing what in terms of the composition of the bank from other current agency functions, such as the enterprise agency, uh, SFT and so on. But the point around the bank is most people will contact the bank not by a physical attendance, but telephone, email, reference, engagement with, with, with other agencies. Um, so I don't think it's about physical location, it's about how you open up the bank's financial products. And although it will be, investments will be merit-based, but as I've, as I've said just a moment ago, the benefits of the bank uh, and the financial tools can have reach right across Scotland. And some of the missions particularly take that low carbon issue where, say, renewables can be delivered um, can absolutely reach to, to parts that other banks can't reach. That sounds like an advert strapline convener that I didn't intend. OK. Um, I, I take that... I, I, I haven't paid a consultant for that advice, I should say. <laughs> well, I think you owed your money back if you did. But um, <laughs> I, I think that... I think for that... I, can I just ask, in terms of local government, you mentioned some of the agencies in, in, involved. Would you see local government having a particular role, a defined role within within the bank structure? Obviously, they have a role within um, for, for Business Gateway at the moment. So, how how would you see that? Oh, the committee has paid very close attention to Business Gateway, Gateway and, and given me rec recommendations that you know kind of suggest we need a bit of national consistency. Actually, mm -hmm. so for that reason and matters that this committee well understands. Mm -hmm. I want the bank to have national consistency. I work closely with local authorities on economic uh, development and following the uh, committee's consideration of Business Gateway, I'm reaching out to local government to see how we can do local economic development better, but I'm not proposing a local role for, for local councils, no. This is a national investment bank. Uh, I want to work with local authorities, but I won't give them a particular decision-making role, but of course there's an expectation that the economic development units, Business Gateway and others work with the bank to make sure it fulfils our potential in every part of the country. Okay, thank you. Well, to use your earlier language, Cabinet Secretary, Andy Whiteman would like to rock up with another question, I think, at this stage. Yeah, well, it is indeed convenient a question about rocking up to the counter. Um, I'm just wondering if um, the, it is envisaged that the Scottish Investment Bank will have to either obtain a banking licence and or be regulated by the Financial, financial Conduct Authorities. That is envisaged that it will not, it will not be. There are subsidiaries of the Development Bank of Wales that that are because of what they do. I'll leave it 
Bishop was desperate to say something. Now they've been deprived all session this morning, so I'll pass that to David. Uh, yeah, no. You, to be clear, the, the bank um, will will not require a banking licence, which was set out in the uh, implementation plan um, last year. There will, however, be a number of more detailed sort of clearances um, with the uh, Financial Conduct Authority, particularly on the use of the term. A bank will need their um, their approval. We'd, we've already been in touch with them. We're not anticipating any um, particular challenge around that, but it's one of the one of the number of approvals processes that we need to go through. Um, and uh, you know, also we'll liaise closely with the FCA about the senior managers' conduct arrangements and, and other sort of more detailed points. But but to be clear no requirement for a banking licence for the nature of the activities yeah. it will do. I, I think some of the issue here is if it had been a retail bank, we, we would have required it. And, and convener, don't underestimate the willingness of some people to invest in a national investment bank, thinking it's a retail bank, but it's not. It's very specific around uh, uh, the mission and what we're trying to achieve in the financial products that we have, which may well grow over time. Uh, that would be a good thing if the bank grows over time and then looks at other functions, but it is as it is. It will do what it says on the tin it, right now. If it had been a retail bank, it would have required a licence. Yes, because the Welsh Development Bank is doing things that demand regulation like help to buy, etc. So there's, there's nothing to rule out such activities in the future if the bank considers that they'd be necessary. Obviously, part of that would be the requirement to, to get a licence, but you don't envisage it at the moment is the key message here. It's not, sorry. Sorry, on you go. No, it's not part of the proposals yeah. uh, uh, you know, at present. The, inevitably, given that the structure of the legislation, there would be opportunities for change and evolution of the bank, but it's not part of the proposals at the moment. Uh, and, and just for completeness, I, I don't think it's true to say that we couldn't do help to buy, because we currently do help to buy, of course. So well, it'd be a question of whether you do it through the bank or not, yeah, because okay. the Development Bank of Wales' help to buy programme yeah. requires regulation. But there's nothing to rule out in 10 years' time this PLC deciding that, um, or perhaps an administration deciding it wanted to get into fields that required licence and going through the due process to obtain one. It's so not there, what you envisage at the moment, though. So there are certain changes that would be, depending on the nature of the change of the bank's functions, clearly what we're doing in statute is to, to enable the bank. We're doing much more in the policy areas. And actually, uh, uh, convener, I think it might be helpful if the committee had sight of the chart that I I had commissioned for briefing today. I'll share that with. I don't know if the committee has this. Uh, so I'm happy to, to share what I asked for. For it's assisted me. Um, so I'm happy to share that. And, and to make the point, there are, there are many elements that um, now, now I've got Mr. Whiteman really excited at the prospect of sharing the chart. But in terms of creating the statute, it is as it is. There's changes you can make within policy and missions and. If there was to be a, a, a much larger change to the nature of the bank, that would require primary legislation. We'd have to return to Parliament, clearly. OK, yes, I'm not particularly excited in, in um, sharing your briefing. <laughs> that would be very useful to say. I'm more excited with the prospect no, I just said the chart. No. <laughs> the chart, yes. Well, if you felt you were able to share your briefings with the committee in advance of every appearance, that would be okay. that'd It would make helpful. all our lives much easier, I suspect. <laughs> Thank you, Convener. Not necessarily. Um, <laughs> But thank you for the offer to share a chart with us. I think it's the first time we've had that offer from a Cabinet Secretary before the committee. Are there any other questions from committee members at this stage? Um, if not, I'll thank the Cabinet Secretary and his team for coming in. And at this stage, I will um, suspend the meeting and we'll move into private session.